Well, good evening, everybody. Happy Dragon Con. Y'all are going to have to do better than that, or this is going to go really poorly. What are you guys doing the way back? Come on up. Happy Dragon Con, everybody. Yay! I mean, it's Friday. It's not Friday. It's Thursday. You're, you're not even supposed to be tired yet. Um, my name is Ron Daniels. I'm a lawyer in middle Georgia. I have a very general practice and have been practicing for 11 years come November and have done just about a little bit of everything from uh, real estate closings to criminal defense to federal criminal defense to uh, defending asset forfeiture cases to doing consumer protection uh, and a little bit of everything in between to be honest with you. Uh, and tonight we're talking about the FAIR Act civil forfeiture reform uh, in the title might be slightly misleading because I'm not going to talk too much in depth about the FAIR Act other than just kind of give you the general contours of it. What I think probably everybody wants to talk about is just generally more about civil asset seizing and the general concepts and the issues with it. Um, but I'll start with the FAIR Act. And, and you should note there are two different FAIR Acts uh, in Congress, which makes this a little bit confusing. Uh, this FAIR Act is the, the one targeted toward really taking back your Fifth Amendment rights against unlawful searches and seizures, particularly the unlawful seizure part. Uh, it is passed out of the House Judiciary Committee with a unanimous vote of 26 to 0. Those of you who are political junkies, raise your hand. Uh, you know that something coming out of the House Judiciary Committee, 26 to 0, is uh, not something that happens every day. So there's bipartisan support for this. Basically, it boils down that the conservative Republicans uh, distrust big government and the Democrats uh, are trying to reel in oppressive police states. And finally, they found something they can agree on, and that's that sometimes the government just taking your property is a bad idea. Um, what is this designed to do in reality? Um, who here doesn't have any understanding at all of civil asset forfeiture? Now, everybody has at least a, a general working knowledge. You, you get pulled over, you've got drugs in your car, and you've got some money. Police say, I'm going to take the money and the drugs and throw you in the hooskow. Uh, that's the general setup. We all seem to understand that. Um, if you look back to where all this started, it it does kind of have a genesis in when we were dealing with mobsters, the mafia, you were dealing with these gigantic money laundering organizations and things of that nature where you've got money that's being allegedly illegally generated uh, and you're trying to stop those organizations from working. And so the government made laws, uh, as they do, uh, that allowed them to take that money. Well, you sit there and you say, well, you know, if money is being made illegally, that might not be the bad thing to do. The problem is um, the standard for finding you guilty of doing those illegal things is beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in the world of your assets getting taken, uh, you don't have to be convicted, number one. Number two, the standard is a preponderance of the evidence. Um, a civil lawyers like to say preponderance of the evidence is we can't quantify it. The courts say we can't say 50% or 75% and things like that. We like to say it's, it's some scales, they're about even, and there's just a little feather on one, and that's preponderance of the evidence. It's just slightly more than the other. Um, not a high standard. Um, reasonable doubt, obviously, is a much higher standard than preponderance of the evidence. You have to not have any doubts that are reasonable. I usually use the analogy of, uh, you know, yes, it is possible that somebody else shot this man. Uh, an alien could have beamed down and shot the man. Um, that is possible, but it's not probable. Do I need the microphone closer? All right. I'm usually loud enough. Um, so reasonable doubt is obviously the higher standard. Promise of evidence is not. Um, and that's what we, we apply with civil asset forfeiture is the preponderance of the evidence. So, and they're not the same case. They're two track systems generally. So you could have all your assets taken and seized and 
completely taken away from you and they say absolutely we've proven beyond a prominence of the evidence that this is illegally generated money and uh, you know we'll convict you you know in six seven years by the way you can't use any of that money you had to hire a lawyer um, or, or to continue your business or anything like that uh, and so that's really where the tension comes is you've got this idea that the government can take your assets uh, because they allege they are related to some sort of criminal activity and it's not really even a great sort of bright line that what what sort of connection is there um, most of the time what happens and I, I don't think this is a secret and I don't think you have to be somebody who's handled one of these cases to know this but most of the time what happens is um, particularly at state level somebody's assets get seized and they for instance in Georgia you get sent a certified letter uh, it gets posted on the wall at the courthouse that they're seizing your property and do you know how many times people actually contest that not a lot not a lot um, most of the time what happens is they get a default judgment that says this property was in fact related to some sort of criminal activity and therefore the government can take it and what does the government do with it do they send it to the Department of Treasury or to the Department of Revenue to decrease all of our tax liability uh, no a lot of times the law enforcement agency that seizes the money keeps it and funds programs some of them uh, may be really good programs to fund like programs for domestic violence victims or uh, for children advocates but it's still at the same time money that's coming from a seizure process that's not really that fulsome um, most of the time it's people just don't file an answer they don't fight it they don't contest it the cases you hear about contesting it uh, you know they're not usually the ones that you know oh we pulled somebody over and they had 600 bucks and um, some pills uh, that's not usually the cases you hear about the, you know we take their car we're gonna take their 600 bucks we're gonna take their Glock that they had because that was clearly related to the crime uh, you know take everything in the car uh, laptops cell phones all that you don't hear too many cases about that the cases you hear about are cases where somebody has forty thousand dollars in a lockbox uh, and the FBI thinks that everybody that has money in these lock boxes is involved in an identity fraud or uh, drug trafficking conspiracy, and so they seize every lock box with more than five thousand dollars in it. That's the cases you hear about. Um, those are important cases, but what I'm trying to convey is that, in aggregate, the cases that you don't hear about getting contested, the ones that don't make the news, the ones that don't shock the conscience probably amount to the same amount of money and the same amount of property uh, as the cases you do hear about and so it's not just an isolated problem to somebody who may be avoiding their taxes uh, like a company in Dublin Georgia was where they were not paying the proper sales tax for a period of about a decade and the entire company got seized uh, by the Georgia Department of Revenue um, you know they were ultimately convicted but their company was taken away from them before they were convicted uh, they couldn't use the company assets to pay for a lawyer um, you know they were stuck and that hurts all of us because then you have people who otherwise were able to use private funds to hire lawyers uh, now have to use public defenders um, you have an entire system of justice that just sorts of bogs down because of it um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the FAIR Act and what it does and what I think it doesn't do well and some of the problems with it. Um, one of the good things about the FAIR Act, one of the things I alluded to, is it does change it to where the money it doesn't just get kept arbitrarily by the agencies. It requires that it be paid in the Department of Treasury. It's important to note the FAIR Act only applies to the federal government. So it, there's 50 states out there with different forfeiture laws, uh, and they can still do what they want to do. Um, it does take away the ability for those funds to be shared to state agencies uh, in its current form and what what happens a lot of times is a state agency will say uh, hey FBI or ATF we've got this really interesting case and we think there's a lot of money uh, and they get the feds to do the dirty work and give them a cut of the check um, just sort of break it down uh, it, it outlaws that um, 
it changes the standard from preponderance of the evidence to clear and convincing. Clear and convincing is a good standard for something like civil asset forfeiture because clear and convincing means what it says. Uh, it has to be clear and convincing evidence, not just hypothetically. It has to move the needle. You have to be pretty sure for it to be clear and convincing. Um, the things that I think probably are bad about the FAIR Act, and, and you know, we're kind of getting in the, the thought process of it here. One beneficial thing of civil asset forfeiture is you might get pulled over, you might have 200 bucks and a small amount of drugs. Um, the government may say, we got his money in his car, we're not going to indict him on this drug case. Um, I can't tell you that anybody would ever admit to that, but it happens. Uh, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen frequently. Um, you're not going to find many prosecutors will say very openly that's what they do. Uh, not many law enforcement officers who openly say that's what they do. It happens a lot. Um, and so I think there is a risk that some crimes that are not being prosecuted now uh, will be prosecuted just as sort of this, I mean, our entire idea of criminal justice is one of retribution. Um, it, it's no secret. Uh, you broke the law, we're going to punish you. Um, losing your money is, in their eyes, an acceptable form of punishment rather than putting somebody on probation or putting them in jail. Um, I think another problem is that it sort of galvanizes the position of the government in some ways that it's okay to do this. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is taking up a case from Alabama. Uh, it was pretty egregious. The Supreme Court in the last couple of years has, uh, oddly enough, sort of taken a, 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 a pretty pro individual stance on some of these forfeiture cases that have been really bad, and that's been a good thing. Um, the other bad thing is the same thing with every piece of federal legislation. You got 50 other states that are going to do what they want to do. Um, some states have done things to make it better in the last decade. Um, it, it's still pretty bad. Um, it, and that's just sort of the long and short of it is the, the Fifth Amendment says that you are not supposed to be subject to an unlawful search or seizure without just compensation. Um, you're not supposed to have your assets taken without being able to be compensated for that. And so um, I would like to, if people have questions, start, you know, y'all pop them up, uh, come down to the microphone, say the question. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I will give you the caveat that I am a lawyer. Um, you are not my client. Um, I can't give you legal advice about any other state except for Georgia. Uh, and I can't guarantee you that the legal advice I'm giving you is right because you're not my client. Um, so don't go out and test theories that I'm telling you about. But with that caveat, if anybody has a question anytime, come on down and ask it. Otherwise, I'm just going to pontificate about my thoughts about asset forfeiture. People are moving. That's a good sign. Test. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Where are you from? Um, I'm originally from Texas, but I live in New York City now. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Pat. All right. Pat, hit me with your question. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, I see that there's a potential use for civil asset forfeiture in uh, to deal with certain types of crime, but I, I also see the abuses. I'm wondering, wouldn't it likely solve most of the useful parts of civil asset forfeiture while curbing most of the abuses to change it from forfeiture into uh, freezing? I, yes. Um, I, the question is whether or not freezing assets instead of just immediately forfeiting them would solve a lot of problems, and it, and it would. Um, you know, you would either then have a conviction where somebody has been found to be engaging in some sort of criminal activity, there's still the question of whether or not 
the assets are born of the criminal activity. Uh, for instance, if I, I'm not trafficking drugs or anything, I promise. Uh, but if I was arrested and convicted of trafficking drugs, um, would my house that I share with my wife that I've had for six years now, would that be an asset born of that? Maybe if I'm using that money to pay the mortgage, but if I'm not and I'm paying through it a different way, uh, maybe not. So, you know, it doesn't solve all the problems because you still have to go through that, that sort of proving the connection uh, or that nexus to the illegal activity. Uh, but it is an interesting thought because the, the problem with freezing, though, is that, um, again, you run into the problem of if it's a legitimately earned asset, you should be able to access it. Um, whether it's to provide for your defense or whether it's, you know, your home uh, or, or, you know, your car. And if it's sitting in a tow yard for two years and you can't drive around with it and you have to get another car, is, is that really, you know, is that really equitable? Uh, is, is something being taken away? So freezing doesn't solve everything. It would be better than what we currently do. Absolutely. Um, great question. Anybody else got something? Good. Come on. I live for Q&A. Uh, if one has their assets seized, it goes to trial, one is found guilty and is assessed a financial penalty, does the seizure count towards fulfilling that penalty? Um, yeah, but wh what's your name, where are you from? Sorry, it's just a habit. Uh, my name's, so I'm originally from Marshbrook, UK, but I live here in Atlanta. Okay, uh, good to meet you. Um, so, typically the way it works with the four, so if, if, the question is, if you were convicted and, and found liable that you, you, your assets were illegally gained and you're assessed a penalty in addition to your assets being taken, whether that would offset or count toward it, um, it depends on the jurisdiction. Um, in some, yes, and in, in many, no. I think the, the standard in the federal courts has been if you are hit with a federal fine, um, usually your assets that have been seized and taken, the judge is not going to consider that to be part of, of paying your fine. But United States probation may. Um, I, I will tell you another thing is a, a lot of times if, you're, if you see people that are convicted of drug trafficking or um, any, any sort of these higher level crimes where people get these million dollar fines and, and all these things, um, most of them don't pay that million dollar fine ever. Um, so, you know, that, I don't know that that's a secret really. It, it, you know, it sounds great to have a statute that says if you break this law that we consider to be especially heinous, uh, you are going to owe $250,000. I don't have $250,000 just hanging out that I'm going to throw it at a fine uh, like a parking ticket. Uh, and I sure as heck am not going to make $250,000 in Department of Corrections or Bureau of Prisons uh, unless I'm doing something else illegal, which they would probably try to prosecute me for, uh, as they should. Uh, so the realistic nature of those fines, it, it sounds like a deterrent, um, but whether or not they actually work sometimes, I, I think there's a lot to be said for whether you actually are accomplishing anything other than making it sound really super scary. Because um, it does sound scary to say you're going to make you pay a million dollars. Um, but, you know, people don't stay on probation for the rest of their life based on one case. Their probation is for 20 years. And in you know, 20 years, they don't just keep them on because they haven't paid their million dollars. But great question. How's it going? Good. How are you? Doing all right. What's your name? Where are you from? Uh, Eric, and right here from Atlanta. Oh, well, welcome to your first Dragon Gun. Uh, thank you. Um, so there's a term of uh, statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. Does that apply to civil forfeiture at all? Like, if it's taken and you don't fight it within a certain amount of time, does that just poof? you no longer have a case or does the fair act of, of, of like taking into account that or try and fight that if that is the case 
So the FAIR Act, that's a great question. The FAIR Act does do something that I did not mention, is it requires that if your assets get seized and you cannot otherwise afford a lawyer, that you get a lawyer. I think it's always great that if you're in court that you have a lawyer. Um, just putting that out there. I'm not getting paid by other lawyers to say that. Um, but I see a lot of people in court without a lawyer, and it, 98% of the time it goes better with a lawyer. Um, you know, it, you don't you don't try to operate on your foot without going to a doctor. Most people don't, and usually when you do operate on your foot without talking to a doctor, it doesn't go well. Um, so, sort of the same premise. But um, to get back to the question, yes, there is a time frame that you have to file either an answer or a claim, uh, depending on the jurisdiction. If you don't do it within that time frame, you lose. Um, you, your property is belongs to the government, whether it's the federal government, the state government, uh, whoever it is that seized it. If you fail to answer, it's theirs. Um, the Fair Act does in does sort of make those deadlines a little bit more prominent, so you know about it, um, and it does add that you get a lawyer, uh, which right now, for instance, in Georgia or in federal courts, um, you're not entitled to a lawyer if your assets are seized. Um, I will tell you because I do some uh, federal defender cases under the Criminal Justice Act in federal court. Uh, usually when a client is arrested and their property has been seized by the federal government, we become involved in that. But it's usually a good while after they've been arrested by a state authority and their assets have already been taken. So, um, you know, it, it, it just does not work out too well for the individual in the current system. You got another one? Uh, yes. Uh, so let's say that you have the ear of, of either the current or some future U.S. president, and they're interested in dealing with the uh, 50 states issue. Uh, is is this something that the um, that the national level le legislature could just pass a law that would uh, force all the states to uh, to change how they how they handle this issue, or is this one of those uh, things where they would have to dangle access to certain uh, certain funds in order to incentivize them to align? <coughs> with some kind of a uniform legal code or like how how would you potentially address the 50 state issue so that uh it isn't necessarily handled literally on 51 actually i guess given u.s territories like puerto rico and so on probably more than 50, uh, 51 different battlefields um so you sort of stole my thunder there with the second part of the question <laughs> Um, it's the, the seatbelt issue um, or, or the, the, the drinking age issue. It's, you know, um, not, not DOT funds in this instance, but you find some sort of way to incentivize the states to do something uniform by holding a carrot in front of them. And the stick, there's not necessarily a stick other than you just don't get this money. Um, is that a great setup? Uh, I don't like compulsory things like that, um, just to be honest with you. I, um, you know, the, the issue is obviously we have what's called dual sovereignty. You can be prosecuted um, if, if somebody runs down the hall and, uh, you know, I don't know, throws tomatoes at somebody and, and hurts them. They can be prosecuted for a federal crime and for a state crime. And it's not double jeopardy. Um, the courts have said that you can, if there's a federal statute and a state statute, both can prosecute you. And guess what? You don't even get the benefit necessarily of your sentences running concurrently at the same time. They might run your sentences consecutively. It happens a lot had it happened to clients. Um, so we have this idea that we've got two different governments, and I don't know that there's a great solution to force states to do what's you know one thing or not uh, particularly with the 10th amendment because it's not expressly laid out in the constitution that all law enforcement shall be done by the federal government uh, and that's probably quite frankly a good thing that not all law enforcement is decided at the federal level um, but um, you know in, in terms of ways you could do it i think the carrot and stick method of, of dangling money uh, is a way to do it 
Um, that seems to be the tried and trusted, me trusted method. I think another way of, of doing it would be, um, you know, just trusting people. Um, I, I think at some point in time, if you you don't find issues like this that people get passionate about, but also that their elected officials tend to coalesce around an idea. Um, I, I think at some point in time that tips over uh, and that you get something closer to a uniform standard. Um, and I think by taking charge with it and coming up with things like having the clear and convincing standard instead of a promise of evidence standard, I think that's something you probably would see all the other jurisdictions take on. I mean, as you alluded to, more than just the 50 states, you've got the District of Columbia, you've got Puerto Rico, um, the Samoan Islands, all of them. Um, so I think by acting would probably be the best way to spur change in, in, in all the other jurisdictions, but other than offering them cash, uh, which seems to motivate people to do a lot of things. Uh, I don't know why. Um, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> you got to make more money from from whatever incentive we're offering you than than what you're making from the forfeitures. But um, you've got a question. Yeah, uh, Doug from Illinois. Hey, Doug. Uh, I was just kind of curious if you could clarify. You were saying in Georgia, they only have to give you certified mail yep. out of the federal government. They don't have to. Do, what are the certified mail personal service? Um, so it depends on exactly what it is they're seizing. Okay. Um, and I say that because under under some things like firearms, um, they don't have to personally serve you. Um, but if they're going to seize large amounts of money, it's not like serving with a court case necessarily. Sometimes it is, but sometimes there's a, almost an administrative system that they do where they just seize things and take it. Um, without giving you an opportunity to fight unless you go and essentially file a claim and then they file the court okay. case. So it, it just depends. Uh, there's two different. And that's one thing the FAIR Act does try to do is it tries to get to a more uniform system of this is how we notify somebody that your stuff is getting taken. Yeah, to me it seems like the most logical way to do it. I don't know about the service way. It would be when you have an item taken, they give you a number. And then, yeah. and like maybe an informational brochure saying these are your rights. Yeah. And then, if it's your job at least to challenge it, I would yeah. just find it very offensive that I feel like the government's always like a small claims debt collector. But if it's under five grand, it's just like I got a free, crappy car, free crappy car. Yeah, you know, um, it, it's funny you use that analogy because, uh, um, in reality, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, it, what's the path of least resistance? Do you want to go get all those receipts? Do you want to go pull all those bank statements and sift through all this, or do you want to, you know, prove really that you own this 1999 Geo Metro? I've, I've been on a call where there's the government's deck uh, for civil forfeitures. I was just there for another reason. Yeah. And it's like one guy showed up, and it's like a 200 item call. Yeah. That's, you know, nobody shows up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it would make sense to me that you you require always personal service. Um. I think really and truly, and, and I, I say this as somebody who has to send things by certified mail mm -hmm. in some parts of my practice, and sending something by certified mail really it doesn't accomplish anything. I, I, I actually think it's worse than sending it by regular mail, because a lot of people don't get their certified mail, and if you don't sign for it, you don't get it. Yeah. So like, if I send it by regular mail, you're actually more likely to get it. Right. Um, and And... My practice in my office, this is sort of getting out there in a tangent, but in my practice in my office, I send something certified mail, it goes out regular mail too. Yeah. Because of exactly that. Somebody can refuse to sign for something. Um, you know, if I've got the right address, um, it gets there. But then there's the problem of, you know, we're not the society we were 200 years ago. People don't stay in the same address as long as they used to, you know. Um, people move month to month. Sometimes they move week to week. I mean, we're a very transient society. And I don't mean transient in a bad way. I mean transient in the fact that we're more mobile. Um, you know, the way people can work today, post-pandemic, you don't even have to go to the office. I mean, I could do, I could do about 75% of my job if I wanted to, for some reason, go to Arizona and sit in the middle of the desert. 
I'm sorry if there's anybody in the room or watching from Arizona. It's very hot there, and I don't do well in that environment. But I'm sure you love it because um, you're there. I know Illinois attorneys that basically practice out of Florida. Yeah. In yeah. The winter. I mean, I don't know if that's the place I would go personally. but you know. <laughs> Maybe Orlando. Maybe Disney World. Uh, question? Yes. Come on down. Hi, I'm Russell. I'm from here. Hey. So let's say, kind of going back to that situation you described where you have a seizure of a vehicle, some money, um, drugs, and a gun perhaps. And they don't get an indictment on any charges because of that. But let's say that $200 or so is something they legitimately have proof that they worked for. Is there any danger in trying to claim back that money? Could you be risking a charge in that situation? Kind of like poking the bear? You would hope not, Russell. Um, I do know a situation where somebody was prosecuted for something and they alleged um, in that basically the prosecution. And, and, and sort of give you the full background, I have a friend who went to law school with me, graduated with me. He's a practicing attorney. He was representing a criminal defendant who was in a county jail. They seized certain property. He went and met with the client. The client authorized him to sign with express permission his name to a claim form. Because that's another thing in Georgia is it's not just you've got to file a piece of paper that says, hey, this is mine. You have to say this is mine under oath, which means you have to have a notary, um, in which, by the way, if you're in jail, sometimes that's difficult to do. Uh, but you have to have somebody notarize the document. So my friend notarized the document, or had signed with express permission his client's name, his paralegal or legal assistant notarized it, and they wound up getting prosecuted. Now, they won the forfeiture case. Um, and part of their defense at trial, my, my friend, and whatever reason, he decided he was going to take a misdemeanor guilty plea. He did. The paralegal went to trial and got acquitted. Uh, and part of her defense was this was retaliatory because they won the civil forfeiture case. It, it wasn't trying to deceive anybody. It says signing with express permission. They were trying to comply with the statute. And they ultimately si had the client actually backfill it and go in and sign a new one. Um, and so I would like to think that doesn't happen. Um, I don't know whether I truly believe that it doesn't happen or not. Um, and I'll tell you, too, you know, I throw around the $200 example. It, it's not just that those situations either I mean there uh, a lot of times you'll see on I-75 going south um, you'll see some sheriff's departments that have things like a Dodge Viper that's got uh, lights and sirens on it and badged uh, that they've seized and they, they take that and it's you know they're a little they, they take to schools for dare or whatever they do nowadays I'm dating myself obviously with dare um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so it's not just always $200 and the rinky-dink car. I mean, sometimes it's the very nice car or um, sometimes it's the, the expensive computer or, or whatever they can get their hands on. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Uh, Andrew from Atlanta. Hey, Andrew. Um, to what extent is forfeiture used as a deliberate tactic to prevent suspects from fielding a defense? Because if you have no assets, you can't pay a lawyer. That's a very good question. Um, the answer is, I don't think there's going to be a statistic on that. <laughs> um, I don't know that anybody would own up to that's what they're doing. Um, but in reality, is it what happens a lot? Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, it really probably impacts more so those people who are you know, they may or may not be engaged in something illegal, um, but but let's say that they have six, seven thousand dollars on their person or or in their safe deposit box or in their house, and they get accused of something. You know, that is real money that you could probably use to. I mean, not just probably that's real money you could pay a lawyer in most parts of the state and get a somewhat competent defense started. Um, you know, it might not get you all the way through trial or something like that, but it m might have you have somebody looking over shoulder saying, hey, you know, what they're doing here is wrong and here's why and get it kicked out. So um, whether that sort of 
malintent is there. I don't know. I don't think people would own up to it uh, if it was. Uh, in practical terms, it's absolutely what happens. Um, when you take people's assets away from them, they can't use them to help themselves. Um, I think probably the most prominent cases I saw involving that were uh, the coin-operated amusement machines, which the, there's been a lot of legislation in Georgia to reform those. But, um, I'm, you know, basically what would happen is they would be giving cash payouts at these convenience stores um, for people playing these machines. And no secret, it's pretty pretty nailed down to one or two different dem demographics that we're talking about, people playing and the people who own the machines. Um, and you would see that these stores would get raided. It would be a multi-jurisdiction task force. You would have four or five different county sheriffs involved, and they would hit, you know, stores 200 miles apart, and they would take the entire store, the entire store, and put it in what's called a receivership, which is this wonderful word for you're getting screwed. Um, because what a receiver is in this context is a lawyer who is billing at $275 an hour who's now running a convenience store and taking inventory and trying to figure out what all the assets are. Uh, and let me tell you, it gets real expensive real quick and your assets get depleted real quick. Um, and I really don't know who it benefits other than uh, the, the people that are taking the money because they get paid and the lawyers that they have appointed as receivers get paid. Uh, but at the end of the day, your, your store is probably not worth a whole lot. And uh, that in Georgia has been curtailed a lot, thankfully. Um, I would love to tell you that I think it was legislation that fixed it. I think it was the fact that there were some very good lawyers, a uh, former attorney general of the state of Georgia, Mike Powers, and some lawyers at a law firm not that far from here uh, started suing some of these people. They caught them in some cases that were probably really bad cases for them. Uh, where they had kind of overreached a little bit and gummed up the works and started getting some acquittals. Um, but it took people to have the other means or people that would finance them to fight that. Um, and most of the people, they would say, okay, I will give up the convenience store. I've got five others. Um, please don't prosecute me. Or please just give me a misdemeanor. And they'd move on. Um, you know, the people that would get burnt would be the people that were the, the clerk, um, not the store owners. Uh, it would be the, the people in the middle who really are doing nothing but doing what they're told to do uh, that got in trouble. And so, um, practically, I think it absolutely happens. Um, if you can find a prosecutor to admit that's what they're doing, uh, you are probably more persuasive than I am, and you should probably be a lawyer. <laughs> Who's got another question? Uh, if one is made to forfeit assets, can you claim that as a loss on your taxes? <laughs> you know, I don't see why not. Um, I honestly think you probably could claim it as a loss on your taxes. Um, the, the setup there being if it was, in fact, let, let me, let me kind of walk that back a little bit. If it is legitimately earned money that was already going to be disclosed on your taxes. I think yes. But should you <laughs> is the question. You can claim illegitimately got funds on your taxes. And in fact, the IRS has a handy dandy Q&A form on their website about exactly how to do that. And there are people that do it. Um, you know, do you, do you put yourself at risk if you're claiming illegitimate funds on your taxes and then showing a loss for those illegitimate funds? Um, I think that would be used as evidence against you in a criminal prosecution, whether it be for tax purposes or for the underlying criminal offense, most likely. Um, but, it, I mean, it is a loss. It's a legitimate loss. And if it was, you know, something like, a, a, you know, a crime of... of you know, that, that you could show that your asset, like your car or something, was clearly, you were clearly not a drug dealer. You had three Xanax in your pocket that were outside of the original container. 
um, and you just didn't want to fight over, you know, your your Honda Accord, uh, which would go for another million miles, um, you know, yeah, you could probably legitimately claim that without any sort of concern. I think the concern would be, are you admitting to something and are you potentially exposing yourself to more criminal liability would be the, the only things that stop you from doing that. I will tell you with the caveat that the, you know, I've been out um, on my own practicing law by myself, hanging my own shingle. I left a firm in 2015, uh, the end of May of 2015, and went out on my own. The very first thing I did was hire an accountant um, because I don't understand taxes, and if you do, uh, you are a lot smarter than me. Um, I just do what that guy tells me to do. <laughs> so um, my tax advice is probably not the best advice is, is what I'm getting at. Who's got another question? Two questions. Sure. Um, first one is, is there a limit to what can be seized? Like, is it just limited to physical, what's around at the time, or can they get into your accounts? Can they get other things that are not actual, like, physical property? Um, and the other question is, I know you said the FAIR Act had progressed out of committee. How does that look to progress any further now that it's out of committee? Does it look like it's going to go anywhere? Is it going to be taken up by the Congress to be voted on? Is there a chance of it actually passing further than just the judicial committee that it's come out of? Uh, so I'm going to answer it kind of in reverse order. The, the second question was, what, what's the likelihood of the FAIR Act passing? Um, something is going to pass, whether it's this year, next year, or the next year. It, it's going to happen. There's too much, there's too much societal push for it. Um, the the congressmen, whether they be representatives or senators, uh, there's enough of them on board. Uh, there's going to be some horse trading over, you know, whether it's going to do all these things that it's coming out of House Judiciary or not. Um, this is the second time around for it. It it, it, it was around a couple years ago. It, it didn't get anywhere. But you, you've got such dynamically opposed individuals who are supporting it that it, some form of it will get passed, if not this time around, very soon. Um, and, and two, it, it, it helps that the stories that you see on the news about people having $40,000 confiscated and they really weren't doing anything connected to everybody else. that that puts a lot of pressure on Congress. Um, what I have learned in my 37 years on this planet and in this country is that um, Congress pretty slow to act. Um, when they do act, it's because people are pretty fed up about something. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's the old analogy of when is the frog going to be bold? Um, it's in the pot, the water's getting hotter. The, it, the frog is going to bowl at some point, um, and we're getting closer to it. Um, the first part of the question, is there a limit? Um, the only limit is their imagination. Um, you, you know, if run-of-the-mill forfeiture case is what's on your person, uh, what's in your immediate surroundings, your more complex um, cases, they're going to get into the bank accounts, they're going to get into... Um, I've never ran into one where they they took you know cryptocurrency, but they absolutely can if if they can get if the government can get its hands on it, and they can make the argument that it's related to the criminal activity, um, they will, and they can. And if they can prove it under the law, um, you know, even if it's the clear and convincing standard the Fair Act's going to bring, they can prove. I mean, then you know that. You know, we can have the discussion about whether philosophically they should ever be able to take assets. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly understand the, the thought process behind coming up with asset forfeiture in the first place. Uh, and, and people can have disagreements about whether philosophically it's a right or wrong thing to do. But, um, you know, even if you, you have this heightened standard of you've got to go to the most strict standard that we have in the burden of proof, if they can show it, then 
you know, they convinced 12 people on a jury or a judge that, hey, this absolutely was. They, as my generation says, they got the receipts. Um, then, yeah, um, it, there, there's no limit. It, it's whether you've got a Mona Lisa painting that they can take or, or you know, a Bitcoin or, or you've got bank accounts in the Cayman Islands that they can find out about, they will take it. Who's got a question? You tried. I did. I did. Brian from Marietta. Uh, just a question. Have you heard any rumors or anything about the laws being updated in Georgia? So we had a great representative from Cherokee County named Scott Turner who was sort of the champion for trying to reform uh, 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 asset forfeiture in Georgia for a number of years. Uh, and Scott is a friend of mine. He has now moved on from being a state legislator. He said he was going to term limit himself and actually did. Um, but now he works on trying to improve legislation on cold cases and getting those, you know, getting cold cases open and getting, not assets, but getting funding for investigating cold cases. And he still somewhat advocates uh, the Georgia legislature about asset forfeiture reform. Um, there's not anything right now that's in the hopper uh, that looks like it's going to impact it. Um, I think a couple years ago when we got a little bit of reforms was all we're going to get for a while. Um, but it, it's the, the growing trend is unhappiness with the power of the state. Uh, and I will say, too, the, the reforms that we got in Georgia, we, we got both judicial reforms uh, that I'll call them, where it, and it's not really the court making up rules it's the court interpreting the rules were there it took a while for that to happen the court has interpreted some of those and curtailed some things by saying no the law doesn't allow you to do that um so i don't think there's going to be anything in the next couple of sessions uh, at some point in time particularly if the fair act passes they're they're going to have to wrestle with it and do something but um and i think ultimately what's going to happen if the fair act passes and they go to a national standard of clear and convincing most of the states are going to either follow suit or or increase it from a preponderance of evidence that they're still at a preponderance of evidence standard who else has got a question have you heard of any abuses in Georgia not that I can talk about uh, <laughs> yeah you know I, so there there were some really hotly litigated cases involving the district attorney down in Bibb County, David Cook, um, and, and particularly with the Georgia Department of Revenue. Uh, and that's sort of those battles that I was alluding to earlier with the Bosch and Bingham lawyers where they were suing uh, him and suing a, a state revenue officer and, and folks like that. Um, those are still, there's still some of that pending out there where uh, it's just, you know, the the criminal act was not a felony and so if the criminal act under georgia laws is not a felony if it's a misdemeanor uh you can't seize the assets and so they they tried the case it was found to be a misdemeanor it was upheld by the georgia supreme court and so they uh, filed a, a civil rights claim a 1983 claim essentially um and that's still out there there's still some of those cases i will say that a lot of that whether it was as a reaction to that happening or or just as a reaction from the public conscious um, most of the district attorneys in the state kind of got away from doing the wide open really expansive rico type of asset forfeiture um and and i didn't, haven't talked about rico earlier but rico we all know what rico is because it's in the news right now but RICO is where you have a what they consider to be a corrupt organization. It's one of the ways that they get to assets that you might not otherwise consider to be illegally gained assets. So the store clerk whose salary, uh, they go home and buy a house. Well, if that salary is the result of illegal activity um, at the store, then uh, their argument is their house is also uh, the fruit of that illegal enterprise, and we should take that. Um, you know, the whole idea being that you're looking at an organization and you're trying to get all their assets to take. Um, 
that's really been curtailed in Georgia, uh, and whether it's just that they got to be so unwieldy or, or whether it was the threat of liability or what have you. Um, you still hear about every now and then, you know, something gets seized like a truck or, or a four-wheeler or something that, um, you know, somebody starts a fuss about. But we don't have really anything that controversial right now. Um, I say that, and tomorrow Department of Justice, the FBI may seize something that just gets all over the news. But right this second, there's not anything that's really hot button out there. Am I out of time? Oh, good, great. I got 10 minutes. I have 12 minutes. We can fit at least three questions in 12 minutes. Come on down. We can do a lightning round. So this is just a basic question, kind of fun. What do they do with all that stuff? Like, all the, like, physical stuff, trucks, four-wheelers. Is that what they do? Like, do they, they have warehouses? They do so many activities. Um, so a lot of it gets sold at auction and turned into cash. Um, some of it they like to keep. Um, some of things they can't keep and or sell. Uh, for instance, a firearm that doesn't have a serial number. Um, so it, it really depends on what the asset is. Um, a, a lot of times what happens, uh, particularly at the local level, uh, is you do see the, the money, the, the actual money that they get from auctioning stuff off um, goes into some sort of special fund, uh, whether that be for, you know, victim advocacy or, you know, some sort of task force funding or something like that. Uh, it just sort of depends. Um, but in, in reality, uh, at least in Georgia, there's you know, very few reasons you have what's called a sheriff's auction. Um, it's either they've seized property uh, because it's related to a criminal case and they've seized it that way, or it's property they've done what we call a levy on, which is, if, if, let's say, I sued you, I got a judgment. Um, I could tell the sheriff, he owns his car, go take his car and auction it off. Um, that's probably about 3% of all the sheriff auctions in the state of Georgia. And the other 97% is assets they've seized as part of a criminal case. Um, and so it gets, they get sold unless they want it for some reason. You know, they want the Dodge Viper or they want the, the Maserati or they want the Rolls. Um, you know, it gets turned into cash one way or the other. Same with the feds. Um, you'll look to see government auctions. A lot of times that's seized property um, that's, that's been forfeited. Who else has got a question? We've got, we got some time still. I've just got told that it's time to stand up for this hour. So come on. we got nine minutes. All right, this should be my last question. So my grand, great-grandfather was a circuit court judge in Mississippi, and a lot of the stuff seized he just got to keep. So, like, we have this old rifle from, like, a militia group that formed in the 60s and was put down. Does that sort of behavior still occur? Can, like, judges take souvenirs from cases and that kind of thing? No, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> uh, thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore. Though I will tell you a fun story real quick before somebody else asks a question. Um, we had in the Dodge Candy Courthouse, which is in Eastman, where I'm from and practice at, uh, leftover evidence from a trial that occurred in the 1980s and this was in 2002 and one of them was a loaded shotgun uh, that was just propped against the wall and a unbeknowing toddler went and pulled the trigger while they were having grand jury upstairs and it uh, fired and the toddler ran around the, the bottom floor of the courthouse screaming because he was deaf and scared to death and everybody come running down so um, yeah, usually firearms in particular are disposed of in, in a certain way. Whatever reason that one wasn't, but uh, people aren't keeping souvenirs anymore. Not not judges. Uh, law enforcement may be keeping a souvenir, like a, a, a car they seize, but, but judges can't really do that anymore. Uh, they would get in a lot of trouble. And they probably shouldn't have ever been doing it. But, you know, if the law allowed it, then why not? Who else has got a question? Come on down. What's your name? Where are you from? And not only that, what's the 
Yeah, so I'm Joe. I'm from Atlanta. This is uh, traditional 13th century German clothing. Oh, cool. That, yeah, so I'm a historical reenactor. So my question is, what's the current state of jurisprudence between the various uh, district courts and federal on uh, for forfeitures? Is it generally unified, or is there some really wild jurisprudence out there? So they're really, you know, uh, there. With so many issues, there are we have what's called circuit splits, and and people are different courts and different. You know, the twelfth district and the eleventh district court of appeals, they may disagree about something. Forfeiture is one of those things that's the the body of law is pretty. It, it's pretty solid. Um, there's not any wildly different. Uh, you know you can do this here but you can't do it in California um, what's changing however is the Supreme Court is taking up more and more issues um, they've been more active with it in the last five years than they were in the preceding 25 years um, so and and, and I, I mentioned this earlier they they have been more individual friendly than they had been previously um, which you know count your blessings um, so you know, it it's not that disparate there are there are some subtle differences um, but not anything to, to the degree of like I think in my, my civil context you know our idea of article 3 standing in the 11th circuit uh, is vastly different than article 3 standing in Illinois for example um, and when I say vastly different I mean I can't bring the same case um, same exact acts same exact Facts, I can't bring it in one jurisdiction, I can't in another. So, what's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? Uh, my name is Jim. I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I came in late, so forgive me if you've done this already, but just kind of a thought exercise. If you were a sheriff in Georgia, what would be your argument before uh, asset forfeiture? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think my argument, if I was to be a sheriff for asset forfeiture, one, I would have to have some sort of record of showing that I was not absolutely abusing it, number one, uh, which I, I'll, I don't have any a desire to be a sheriff, but, I mean, if I was a sheriff, I, I will tell you all honestly that I probably would use asset forfeiture pretty sparingly. Um, but I think the, the, the corollary with that is that, you know, sometimes you know you can do it right it, it's not that the idea of asset forfeiture is just this inherently I'm going to take Jim's property um, you could you can make it such that Jim could access his assets to pay for his defense you could just you know not not necessarily freeze it but sort of freeze it not, not a hard frost just kind of a, an icy you know kind of like this water over here, um, where there's still some levels of access to it, it can still be useful, but prosecute Jim and have Jim convicted of a crime. And if I can show that Jim violated the law and Jim's $100,000 is the product of that, um, say Jim's cheating his taxes, whatever. I don't, I don't know what you're... Well, <laughs> hypothetically, Jim, um, let's say John. Uh, John, John's you know skimming, sky, kiting checks, whatever. Um, uh, you know, if I can show that and show that that's where that money came from, then under law, that's you know, that's okay. And I, I mean that that's what my argument would be if I was the sheriff. Um, I have, I have. So I represent two different county governments, and I will tell you that I have a very good sheriff in one that I deal with very frequently. I don't rep do much with the sheriff in the other county. I will tell you the sheriff that I have in that county and the sheriff in the county in which I reside, I, I think are very good law enforcement officers. I think they're very honest people and they're very fair people. Um, neither one of them really trusts the government, which is sort of odd because they are the government. Um, but you know we all have some level of self-loathing I guess um, so I, 
you know, yeah, I would trust some of them. Um, I, I, I think I think there are I think there are people that are legitimately trying to do that right that don't think everybody is guilty. Um, you know, the the sheriff that the county I represent, he he tells people, look, that we act on what we are supposed to act on under the constitutional laws of this, this country in this state is if there's probable cause and we have a reasonable articulable suspicion to arrest somebody we arrest them and if they're found not guilty if they're acquitted then that's the system working and that he tells people that and he doesn't hold it against people if they they get acquitted um, so yeah, I think so. Uh, is that everybody? No. Um, out of the 159 counties and the 159 sheriffs, I would say that's probably an anomaly, but I don't know all 159 of them. We got one minute. One question in one minute. Maybe two questions in one minute. Is it a good comment? Uh, it depends. How much do you like case law? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the tax question that was asked earlier. Yeah. Right. So it's U.S. versus Nacho, and I have a citation for you if you need it, um, that forfeited gains um, from crime specifically are not deductible, um, but that there is no current ruling on non-crime. Oh, so I was not technically wrong. <laughs> I'm in South Carolina. And, and I know that this has happened to a friend of mine owns a cab company, another friend of mine owns a cab company, and two of his cabs were seized by the police when those drivers were arrested selling narcotics out of the cabs. Yeah. Now, how is that, how can they take somebody, somebody's property that they don't even own? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the argument would be if they could prove in the civil forfeiture case that the cab company owner knew that his cabbies were dealing drugs out of his cabs and he was skimming money from them, yeah, then, he yeah, did. but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the problem with it. I mean, that's the problem with it. Uh, and with that, we're out of time. Um, 